Welcome. Today's notes worksheet is entitled Applications with Equations Day 1. We have the enjoyable task today of setting up some equations from word problems and then solving those equations algebraically. So I'll try to develop some strategies and ideas for you and I will go ahead and try to organize our information as best as possible before setting up the equation and seeing if we can come up with something good. So let's go ahead and take a look at the strategies that are on your page here and uh, just some good algebraic strategies and then some specific ideas that relate to these types of problems. So number one, it says determine what you are solving for. So always define your variable. It's easier to set up things when you actually know what it is you're trying to find. So define your variable. And then the way we're going to do this, guys, is with the table. So we're going to use a table to organize the information. And typically, the way these particular problems work out, you'll see them in three columns. And so to highlight this piece, here's what I have, first column, second column, and third column. And very simply, typically what happens is in the first column, you have your information containing your variable and any other quantities that are related to it. So variable in the first column. Then second column, as it says, typically you'll have some specific numerical information about those quantities from your first column. Now the unfortunate thing is column number one and column number two will probably not allow us to set up a good equation to solve. So what we have to do, everyone, is set up a third column. And the third column, as it states, is created from the first two, and the equation will come from this column right here. So at this stage, that just looks like a whole bunch of verbal jargon. Yes, they're good strategies, but you have no context for it at this point. And so what we want to go ahead and do is kind of dive right in. So there are really four different types that we're going to see over the next couple of days here. And so I tried to outline that for you as much as possible. And then what we'll go ahead and do is take a look at at least one or two or three of each and get some experience with it. Not to cop out too much here, but this is one of the more difficult things to teach. I can show you some ideas and strategies and so forth, but ultimately it's going to be up to you to see if um, it resonates and you're able to go ahead and solve some on your own. So let's go ahead and do type 1. Type 1 says rates of return, and that's the type we'll see here for example 1. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty contrived problem, but it's a decent one nonetheless. So an investment firm has $100,000 to invest for a client and decides on stock A and stock B. Pretty simpli uh, simplified, excuse me. Uh, the expected annual rate of return is 15% for stock A and 10% for stock B. That's great. Uh, but there's a greater risk for stock A, so the client wants to diversify, don't want to put it all in A. So how should the firm invest in order to get an ex expected $12,000 return? Okay. So We'll go ahead and set up a couple things uh, through the process here. I'm going to see if I can get my table going probably along here. Maybe you have some room below. But uh, let's go ahead and see what we can do. So the first order of business is to think about what it is we're trying to solve for. And I did some probing questions on here for you so we can look at that. But letter A states, how can we represent the amount invested in stock A? And as a matter of fact, that is one of the things we need to solve for. So how do we represent something we don't know? Well, obviously with the variable. And what I'm seeing just right away here is one of the columns that we're going to use is the amount invested. So go ahead and put that either down below or off to the side, wherever uh, you can find room here. And then basically what we have, guys, is we're going to invest a certain amount in stock A and a certain amount in stock B. So again, we defined our variable as the amount invested in stock A. So there's your X right there. First column, it's good to get the variable out in front. And that's what we have. That's what we're looking for. All right. Now, guys, let's stay with that column and with this idea. Letter B on your paper. How can we represent the amount invested in stock B? And in this case, other than just a separate variable. So um, sometimes you see a problem like this using two equations and two variables. We're going to try to streamline it a little bit and just go one variable on it. So everyone, look at the information in the problem and think about if I, amount, if I excuse me, invest X dollars in stock A, how can I represent the amount invested in stock B? And if you look at the problem, it says $100,000 is invested in each of the two stocks. So if this is X right here, I would venture to say that this has to be 
100,000 minus X. Okay, that's great. Now, if you notice, there's really nothing I can do with this. You know, I've got my two variables, well, my two quantities with the single variable in there, the amount invested in A and the amount invested in B, but there's no equation we can create from that. So, we've got to go out and get some other pieces to this. Let's fill that in in the meantime. And now, let's go ahead and talk about the numerical information that I have on how much we're going to invest in stock A and stock B. And so here we go. This would go to the next column right here. Uh, actually, really, it's C, uh, letter C right here. It says, what is the rate of return for stock A? Well, I know that specifically in the problem. The expected annual rate of return is going to be 15% for stock A. So given in the problem, that's the information we know about stock A. And I also have the same numerical information about stock B. So 10%. The rate of return, hence again, the title of the type of problem we're looking at. So the rate of return, I'm going to try to throw in right here, 15% for A, 10% for B. Okay, great. Now here's the key, and this is what is going to be a challenge to you as you do some of these on your own, is I have this column and I have this column. How can I create a third column using these two things? And so I guess if I look at this, I have the actual dollar amount that I'm investing in each stock represented with these two algebraic expressions. And I have the percentage of the return from each investment here. What I would argue is that we have the actual return. We have the amount of the return, how, much, how many dollars we will receive in interest, so to speak, after it's invested. So we have the rate of return and the amount. Those two together should give us the actual return on the investment. And if you notice, of course, this is what we're going to be looking for here. There's a $12,000 return total. And so that third column is going to allow us to meet that. All right. Well, let's go ahead and read letter D. What is the actual return on the investment in stock A? So, of course, guys, you invest X dollars in stock A, and you get a 15% return of that investment. So 0.15 times the number of dollars that we put in. So 0.15x. That's the key right there. We know the percentage, and we know how much we're going to invest, and so our return is that percentage of the amount invested. Okay, good. Letter E, then. What is the actual return on the investment in stock B? Well, I'm going to invest 100,000 minus X into the account, into stock B, and my return will be 10% of that. So whatever monetary value I invest in stock B, of course we're going to multiply that by 10%. And that's going to be this piece right here. Okay, so... Now we've got three good columns. If you, if you look at this carefully, it should match my strategies from above. Variables in the first column, numerical information about those variables in the second column, and then we combine them together in some way in order to create the third column, and our equation is going to come from this. And remember the situation. Here's the idea. You knew the third column had to go with something along these lines right there the $12,000 return, the monetary return, and it comes from stock A, and it comes from stock B. And so what I'm seeing is that the return from stock A, which we had is 0.15x, plus the return from stock B, which is the 10% of the 100,000 minus X, that should equal 12,000. And there is pretty much it. I mean, that should do it. So take a look at that piece. Obviously, what we want to do is, is solve this equation and make sure we've answered everything appropriately. Uh, I'll go ahead and take a look at those steps momentarily, but should take a step back and make sure at least everything clicks. So let's just kind of go in line. This is the first column right here. So first column with those. Second column with this. And then from that, what can we gather? Well, 
again, we're able to get the actual return on the investment, and so that's the third column right there. All right, well, let's go ahead and see what happens here. I get 0.15x, and then it looks like 10% of 100,000 is 10,000, and then minus 0.1x, and that equals 12,000 right there. Looks good. And just some nice basic math at this point. Probably want to go ahead and combine these x terms together. So I'm getting about 0.05x. And maybe in the same breath, let's bring that on over to the other side there. And I'll go ahead and get 2,000 on that. All right, very nice. Uh, if you want to grab a calculator, everyone, and just take 2,000 and divide by 0.05, and I believe we're looking at 40,000 when that does happen there. That's at least what I'm getting mentally, and I'm going to go with it. So I'm going to have to bring it right up here, and it looks like I'm going to get X is 40,000. So we do want to make sure, of course, we've answered our, our question completely. So the variable is 40,000, and what that means, basically, the amount invested in stock A is going to be $40,000. Remember, that's exactly how we defined our variable. And then the amount, of course, invested in stock B would be 100,000 minus that, so 60,000. And that, I believe, is our combo. Always a great idea to check. You know, when you're all is said and done there, if you want to go ahead and take 15% of that and add 10% of that, make sure it quantifies nicely up to that 12,000. I'm going to box that up, though, because I'm pretty confident that that's a great answer. So again, just nice and easy working through a, sort of a table to organize their information and then looking for where the equation might come from. And in this case, sorry for being redundant, but you know, the amount of return, the return in A plus the return in B had to be equivalent to 12,000. All right, there's your first. Let's move on. So second type, again, just kind of at this level that we see, is a mixture problem. Same deal. We'll see if we can go ahead and put a couple tables together and ideas. I know this goes on to the back side there, so um, I might be switching boards every now and again, and you guys might have to flip over a little bit. So here we go. A chemist has 10 milliliters of a solution that contains a 30% concentration of acid. How many milliliters of pure acid must be added in order to increase the concentration to 50%? So it starts at 30%, increase the acid, or add acid in order to increase the concentration to 30. All right, very nice. So the first order of business is to kind of take a look at what we're trying to solve for here. And I, I would say it's kind of the volume of the acid, the amount of acid that we're going to add there. So as I look at letter A, and I don't mean to go out of order by any means, but I think this is what our variable is going to be right there the volume of pure acid, how many milliliters of pure acid are we going to add? And so we can kind of see what the title of our first column is going to be, because if it's the vo volume of pure acid, then what else do we have? We, we have the volume of the 30% solution, which is 10 milliliters. That's what we're going to start with. And then we're going to add the pure acid to it, and then we should be able to get 10 plus X from here. Just make sure that makes pretty good sense. So just visually, if we can picture this piece, we start with 10 milliliters of the 30%. I'm going to add a certain amount of acid to that. And when I add the volumes on top of one another, obviously that would be the volume of the complete uh, solution. Okay, good. So I'm going to go ahead and start getting my table set up there. It looks like I left a little room here to do this. And so I guess the, the first order of business is to talk about the volume of the solutions. So something like that would be good. And we had the 30% solution, the pure acid, and that has to add up to getting us to 50%. So these are the three solutions that are in play. And again, the idea is that we start with 10 milliliters, so its volume, we add X milliliters of pure acid to it, and as a result, of course, we have 10 plus X milliliters of what would be a 50% concentration. So the first column, again, has our variable in it, along with some other information that we probably will use. And it's all based on the volume. Okay, great. 
Let's go back. Again, another kind of probing question here. So variable right there, first column, done. Second column, what do we know numerically about each of those uh, solutions? Well, we know what we would call the concentration. If you look at the problem, those three pieces are given. The concentration of the 10 milliliters, the acid, and the 50% solution there. Okay, great. So we have what is the concentration? Concentration means the percent of the solution containing acid for each. And I guess in this case, we start with a 30% solution. We're going to add pure acid, so 100%. Obviously, as a, um, as a decimal, 100% is equivalent to the number one. And um, that would give us a 50% solution. So we have what we would call the concentration of each solution. And I think that's how I'm going to title my second column right here. So the concentration of each solution. That was totally given in the problem, explicitly for the most part. Obviously, we, with the acid, we just kind of figured it was 100%. So 0 0.3, 100, so 1 right there, and 50%, so 0.5. All right, so we know the volume now represented by these algebraic expressions. We know the concentration of acid. So let me just say that the concentration, yeah, let me word that just in a slightly different way, um, in a slightly different way, excuse me. So here's how I would say it a little better. Concentration of acid in each solution. That's better, I like that. And there we go. All righty. Now, the question is, once we know these two pieces, what's the third thing that I know? What can I garner from these initial two columns right here? Well, if I have the percentage of acid and I have the volume of the solution, it seems to me that we can pretty much get the amount of acid in there, right? If I know that this solution is 30% acid and there are 10 milliliters total, don't I kind of know the amount of acid in each solution? And that, as you can see, is sort of the third probing question right here, hence the third column. And so it says, what is the amount of acid in the 30% solution? Well, let's title this right here. And then let's go for it. So what is the amount of acid in the 30% solution? I know that I've got 10 milliliters in there. And I know that 30% of that 10 milliliters is acid. And so as a result, I'm seeing this as 0.3 times 10. Okay, so again, here's my volume, and I have the percentage of acid. And so here's the quantity that I can now get. Um, how much pure acid do I have? Well, I don't know how many milliliters I, I'm going to put in, but 100% of it, of course, is, um, is acid. So... I would say this is 1 times x. And then last but not least, the 50% solution, I'm going to have 10 plus x milliliters in there. There's no question about that. And I know 50% of those milliliters is acid. And so 0.5 times that. And so now we can put this together in our table. There we go, 30% of 10, 100% of x, and 50% of 10 plus x. And now we've got something to work with, which is wonderful, because I pretty much can figure out that the amount of acid that I started with plus the amount of acid that I add into it is equal to the amount of acid total. This plus this is exactly how we make this piece right here. And so I think that's our equation. 0.3 times 10 plus the x and equals 0.5 and how does a 10 plus x sound? I've had students in the past with these problems literally draw beakers with uh, each of the solutions, and they can kind of see it. You know, the solution in one or the acid in one plus the acid in the other, that's how we get the full concentration at the end. OK, well, let's go ahead and put this together. 30% uh, of 10 should be 3, so 3 plus x, and then uh, see 50% of 10, so there's 5 right there, 
and then plus 0.5x. And let's go ahead and solve this. Just some nice basic algebra at this stage. I'm going to bring the 3 on over, and that would be 2. Let's bring the 0.5 on over, so 1x minus 0.5x is 0.5x. Sounds good. Divide by 0.5, and 2 divided by 0.5 should be 4. And so if you kind of look at this piece right here, just we always want to make sure that we solve for um, our intended variable. And we wanted the amount of acid poured in. That's our variable. That's what we solve for. And so I guess we would say 4 milliliters of pure acid. And there's your winner. All right, so that's your mixture problem. We'll do one more of those just to kind of put it together but it will probably uh, follow a very similar format. All right. Well, let's give it a try. Example three. So again, if, if two wasn't great, let's see if we can really solidify it on three. So example three, how much water must be added to six liters of pure alcohol to form a 23% solution? All right. Sounds good. So the first thing is we're talking about the volume of water, right? So. Uh, again, we've got the volume of these solutions. So that's how I'm going to title that first column. We want to know how much water. And so let's see what we're starting with. Always a good idea. I've got the alcohol going. I'm going to add water to it. And I'm going to get a 23% solution after I combine those together. So let's talk about the volume of those three quantities right there and uh, see if we can get that first column taken care of. So from my vantage point, everybody, we are starting with six liters of pure alcohol. Sounds good. So there is the volume of alcohol. And we're going to add a certain amount of water to it. Obviously, that's our unknown. That's what we're trying to find. And after we add a certain amount, should give us the volume there of the 23%. Okay, and again, there's, there's no equation coming from that. As you can see, nothing worthy there. So we need to introduce an additional quantity. And what is the uh, information that we have in some way, shape, or form on these right here? Well, I've got the concentration. So concentration, and it, it's up to you how you want to do this. I'm going to do it as the concentration of alcohol. And that's what we kind of have here. So pure alcohol, the 23% solution does mean 23% alcohol. And so as a result, what is the concentration of alcohol in each of these three right here? Well, obviously, if you look at it carefully, pure alcohol is 100%. So a 1 in terms of the concentration there. Seems kind of weird that we're going to do this, but this is how it's going to play out, guys. I mean, the concentration of alcohol in pure water is going to be zero. So um, <laughs> zero right there. And then ultimately, we want to get this to be a 23% solution. So 0.23 on that. And then what we need to do, again, here's our numerical information on these three right here. We need to somehow tie those together. And as you can see, it's going to work out the exact same way. I know how much liquid is in each solution in terms of the number of milliliters. I know the percentage of that that is alcohol. And so if I know the total amount and the percentage that's alcohol, then I should be able to get the amount that is alcohol. And so that, guys, is going to be our third. And so I know exactly how much alcohol is in each of the three and that's what we should be able to tie together. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and do this. How much alcohol is in that first one right here that we start with? Well, all six milliliters are alcohol, or six liters in this case, excuse me. Good. How much alcohol am I adding when I put the water in? No more alcohol. Sounds good. But when all said and done there, how much alcohol is in the final solution? Well, 23% of the, the volume. And so 0.23 times the 6 plus x. And now, of course, you look at this table, and it's exactly what I wanted, because I organized my information to get this piece right here. And now I know that the alcohol that we start with 
plus the alcohol that I add to it is equal to the total alcohol. Okay, even though if we just kind of put a zero right here, it was really useful in getting this piece right here. So I know it seems kind of silly, but I'm going to put the zero in just to make sure. So we've got that added together with that, and that gives us this right here. Great, and now I have something to work with, something logical. The amount of alcohol we start with plus the amount of alcohol we add is equal to the amount of alcohol in the final solution there. All righty, so let's go ahead and put this together. So I might bring my calculator up for the first time here, might need that piece. So 0.23 times that 6, might, I might need it. So let me grab my calculator here. There we go. And I do 0.23 times the 6. And there we go. So I'll keep that in mind, that 1.38. So 6 equals 1.38 and then the 0.23x right there. Perfect. I think we'll go ahead and subtract this piece right down there. And if I'm not mistaken, subtracting this, I end up getting about 4.62 on that. Just want to make sure I have that piece. And then equals 0.23x. I think we should be able to divide and get a final answer there. Unfortunately, I can't do that mentally, so I'm going to bring my calculator up one more time. And... What do we say there? 4.62 divided by 0.23. And I think we have our winner. So not the best number around, but we'll go ahead and round that accordingly. I would say we've got about 20.09. And if, just make sure this is the variable. That's what x is. What did it represent? The volume of water. And that's exactly what we wanted. And so as a result, I'll just go ahead and throw... Uh, liters on that one of water. And there you go, guys. That's looking great. So that's just the second time around. Obviously, there are going to be variations here. But generally speaking, you're going to have your three columns emerge as you see right in here. Volume, percent concentration, and then the actual amount of whatever it is we're looking for. Cool. All right, so we've done rates of return, we've done a couple mixture, and we'll wrap up uh, today's notes worksheet with what we would call uniform motion. And so this is basically um, a quantity moving at a constant rate. And, uh, you know, from your basic science classes here, we'll kind of use this idea, uh, something that is moving at a constant rate. Uh, its distance, rate, and time are tied together, of course. Um, with this equation right here. Distance is equal to rate times time. So that's what the D, R, and T will represent. There's some good news with this, as a matter of fact. Um, we don't have to really stress too much about our columns and how we're going to title them, because quite frankly, anything with uniform motion, there are going to be your three columns. Distance, rate, and time. So let's just try one out here. Again, I've got some probing questions. Throw a little table in, and we'll go for it. So example four, two cities are connected by means of a highway. A car leaves city A at 1 o'clock and travels at a constant rate of 40 miles per hour towards city B, convenient enough. Half hour later, uh, another car is traveling from city A to city B, so same type of thing, at a constant rate of 55 miles per hour. At what time will the second car reach the first car? So I don't know. You can be visual with this if you like. Here's city A. So first car, the slower car, is, is off at 1 o'clock. And then a half hour later, the second car is going a little faster. And what, at what time will it catch up with the first car? All right. Again, just kind of a standard um, test question that you see at this level. So let's go ahead and see what we've got going. Um, as I do these problems, by the way, when, when I'm talking about distance, rate, and time, uniform motion, you know, just in my mind, I'm thinking about those three columns right there, so distance, rate, and time. And I've got the first car and the second car. So first car is leaving at, uh, at 1 o'clock, and then the second car is leaving half hour later. We'll see what we want to do with that. So in this case, what we want to do is just kind of fill in those, uh, 
quantities appropriately. So I like to start out easy, you know, and, and letter A to me is the easiest piece. What is the rate or the speed of the first car and the second car? Well, if you notice, in this case, that's the numerical information that is given. So when it says uh, rate of the first car, the slower one is going 40 miles per hour. Second car, the one that's going to eventually catch up to it, the faster one, hey, everyone, that's going 55 miles per hour. So just kind of looking at my distance rate and time, you know, that one was almost a gimme. It was given in the problem for both our cars here, and so we fill that in. Okay. Now here's where we want to just be a touch careful. I think this is what we're going to be looking for right here in terms of our variable. How many hours does the first car drive? How many hours does the second car drive? Um, not given. You know, all we know is eventually we're going to have to figure out at what time will the second car reach the first car. So we have a couple ways to do this here. I'm going to label my first car, let's go over to time, the time that the first car drives, you know, really from 1 o'clock, as, as X. So X number of hours that this first car is going to drive. So I illustrated it here. However, um, however long this car is driving, that's what I'm going to solve for here. Now here's the key, and I'm curious if you can kind of figure this out. If this is X, the slower car is X, um, what is the time that the faster car travels? And again, let's try not to use a different variable. So look at the information in the problem, and what do you think? So a car leaves City A at 1 o'clock and travels. Good. We're going to figure out how, how long after 1 o'clock that happens. Um, but here's the key. The second car leaves a half hour later. So I guess I would ask you this. Do you think that the second car is going to travel more time or less time than the first car? And in this case, if it left a half hour later, it's going to be a half hour less than the first car. And so I have it on my sheet as x minus 1 half. Now, I just wanted to make sure everything was in units. So this I saw was miles per hour. And so that's why I kept my time unit in hours. You don't want to put a 30 here. So I hope that makes sense. However long this car has driven, the second car has driven a half hour less than that because the car has gone a half hour later. Okay, so we've got x and x minus that half hour. Okay. Now, guys, we use the same deal. One column has our variables in it. Not much from there. One car has our numerical information. We've got that, and I need to use these right here to create the third column. And distance is equal to rate times time. And so as a result, everyone, how far has the first car traveled? 40 miles per hour times the number of hours. How far has the second car traveled? 55 miles per hour times x minus 1 half hours. And that's looking pretty good. So let's see. We've got those two pieces all laid out. Again, when you do this, obviously, you're just going right in the table. I'm just trying to back this up as a teacher, trying to just reinforce it as much as I possibly can. But let's see what we can do now. What do we know about those distances? So our equation should come from here. Any ideas? So if you look at the problem and you look at my uh, ridiculously simplified drawing right here, slower car, faster car is eventually going to catch up. Would you agree that if they you know, leave at the same spot and whatever, they get up there, they, they travel the same distance? And so as a result, I've got the distance of the first car being equal to the distance of the second car. And so there are your two algebraic expressions set equal to one another. Great. Um, I would ask us to just maybe quickly solve this. Uh, I'll see what I can do mentally and maybe grab the calculator, but distribute the 55 in, and let's see, 27 and a half right there, something like that. So half of the 55 should suffice. And uh, looking pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and bring this on over. So this would be negative 15x at this stage equals negative 27.5. Let's do the division here. I'm going to bring this on up on my board. And guys, let's get x. 
So it did kind of say from after 1 o'clock here, so after the first car left. So I kind of liked having our variable being in terms of the first car. Obviously, uh, if you didn't, no big deal. So we've got negative 27.5, and I'm going to divide that by, looks like, negative 15. Perfect. I get 1.83 repeating. And by the way, just FYI, 0.83 repeating um, as a fraction would be 5 sixths. So I'm going to just write it like this. So x would be 1 and 5 sixths hours. And, you know, if you left it like that, obviously it's not the end of the world. I mean, that is correct. Everything looks good. You know, I'm just reading the problem right here. And, you know, really it's officially from how many hours after 1 o'clock and then getting the time from there. So what I see is 1 and 5 sixths hours after 1 o'clock. So 1 hour and 5 sixths of an hour, which happens to be 50 minutes. So this would be an hour and 50 minutes, just FYI which I guess if we solved everything perfectly there, we'll say 250. All good. Again, if you got this far and you're pretty comfortable with that, I can certainly live with that piece. We will definitely do at least one or two more uniform motion problems on the next notes worksheet. So if, um, you know, first time around it didn't quite click the way you wanted it to, uh, give it another time uh, when we hit that next notes worksheet. But uh, again, just trying to work through some problem solving here, interpret what the word problem has to offer, organizing the information appropriately and algebraically, and then coming up with an equation from there. Be great for you to get some practice on it, and then obviously uh, take a look at some of my answers as well as you go through it there. And please obviously ask questions. We can kind of sometimes talking it through, um, you know, makes it easier to create some of the algebra that you see. Thanks so much for listening to this, and uh, please definitely in inquire if you have some issues.